sits serenely, the queen of bridges, elegantly spanning a mile of turbulent water. But its birth was a fiery mix of high-minded idealism and individual arrogance, a collision of dedicated workers and desperate outsiders, all tied by an exceptional community spirit. Now, the extraordinary story of the Golden Gate Bridge on Modern Marvels. In 1848, gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill, a lonely outpost in the hills northeast of San Francisco. Here was the long-sought American dream, a boisterous blend of good luck, hard work, and eccentric charm. Within two years, San Francisco's population soared over 7,000 percent as gold fever attracted legions of fortune hunters with nothing to lose. With unrestricted wealth came all the pleasures of the flesh. Drinking, gambling, opium and prostitution helped give San Francisco's waterfront, the Barbary Coast, a reputation for hedonistic abandon. Early motion pictures reveled in the lascivious lifestyle of the city by the bay. Eventually, the boom went bust, but San Francisco had already been branded a modern city of Sodom by the rest of a puritanical America. There even seemed to be a suggestion of divine retribution when the earthquake in 1906 caused destruction of biblical proportions. Yet San Francisco and its body spirit stood firm. Out of the ashes arose a people even more determined to revel in the zeal of independence. They were the vanguard of a bold 20th century America. In an ironic twist, Mass production in the early 1900s made independence accessible for millions. Inexpensive automobiles allowed the common man the means to chart his own course. The concept was all American, and the rebellious social pioneers of San Francisco were quick to embrace the freedom of mobility. They were particularly fond of weekend jaunts out of the city congestion. Some of the largest traffic jams of the 20th century occurred in 1919 when 123,000 weekend drivers converged on ferry boats which connected San Francisco to Sausalito, north of the bay. And within nine hours, that congestion grew to over two million cars and caused 18-hour delays to board the ferries. The only alternative was a 100-mile circular route around the bay or a bridge across the Golden Gate Strait. Until that time, people generally accepted that it would be impossible ever to bridge the Golden Gate. But now the area's growth demanded that the impossible at least be attempted. The city turned to Joseph Strauss, a recognized bridge engineer who reveled in accepting monumental challenges he had a mixed reputation among his peers. He was seen as arrogant, rude, short-tempered, perhaps the most brilliant bully of his time. Strauss had built bridges for San Francisco in the past, like this 4th Street Bridge. His work was structurally sound, but notoriously unattractive and overwrought. Well, he reveled in the challenge. After three years of computations and research, Strauss came up with a master plan, a large lumbering monstrosity with little practicality or beauty. Reaction was universally unenthusiastic, but he was hungry for the prestige a Golden Gate Bridge would bestow. Joining forces with a quickly organized team of academic engineers, Strauss submitted new designs based on the suspension bridge concept. 
The idea is similar to erecting two tent poles and then breaking a clothesline over the points and anchoring the ends. Vertical lines are then dropped to hold and suspend a horizontal surface. The result allows for greater height between the surface of the water and the roadway, as well as a wide passage for ship traffic. These accommodations to shipping were essential for any structure to span the Golden Gate, so this is the concept Strauss and his men finally promoted. Strauss was a great outside man. He had tremendous engineers with him, but he could go into any meeting and almost captivate him. He had great, great verbal communication skills. He also had a design of unusual architectural beauty, guaranteed to solve the dilemma of Bay Area traffic congestion on the ferry system. Unfortunately, that ferry concession was big business for its owner, the Southern Pacific Railroad Company. It held a monopoly on the franchise worth tens of millions of dollars, which it would lose if a bridge were to be built. To stop the project, Southern Pacific mounted over 2,300 legal disputes. It took an area-wide boycott of the ferry system to force Southern Pacific to drop its nuisance lawsuits. But the people of the Bay Area would be asked to do much more to make the bridge dream come true. Nine years after the bridge was first proposed, the Depression was threatening to tear apart the social fabric of America. There was barely enough money for food. Certainly insufficient funds for government to finance the largest bridge project in human history at a proposed cost of $35 million. Still, men needed work, and San Francisco needed a bridge. Then what happened is something that I submit very, very few people in today's world would ever consider doing, but they held an election in which the people of the six counties went to the polls and they put up their property, that is their homes, their farms, their vineyards, their commercial buildings, as a collateral to guarantee a $35 million bond issue to pay for the construction of the bridge. And I doubt that there are many people today that would put their homes up as a guarantee and collateral on the property tax to build any type of a public works project. But that's what happened. The civic pride was contagious. Even financial institutions were ready to put themselves on the line for the public good. Uh, A.P. Giannini, the Bank of America founder, felt that as a result of the Depression, jobs were necessary, and he offered a $5 million line of credit to go ahead and begin construction of the bridge. So with no government support, the people of San Francisco set out to demonstrate how self-determination and self-reliance could change the world. The bridge they were about to erect would be a link to a better life. A road suspended over the rough currents of hardship. A connection to the future. The cement needed for the piers and anchorages for the Golden Gate Bridge would be enough to build a five-foot sidewalk from New York to San Francisco. The Golden Gate Bridge will continue in a moment on Modern Marvels. January 1933, on a barren finger of land by turbulent waters, official ceremonies usher in a new age as the president of the Golden Gate Bridge Company assists the mayor in starting construction. Mayor Rossi begins the actual groundbreaking ceremonies by turning the first shovel full of earth. He then delivers the golden spade to President William P. Filmer, who instructs Chief Engineer Joseph B. Strauss to start actual construction work on the bridge. And so the maximum accomplishment of engineering science of the 20th century is officially launched. At last, a glimmer of hope that seemed so distant was turning into physical reality. Where there was once only the gloom of depression, was the roar of industry. A city on the edge of America was fighting for its future with a giant-sized dream. It attracted a nation of men hungry for work. Well, I loved that Golden Gate so bad that, man, I would have worked there for nothing if I could get by without, without any money. <laughs> I loved it. I knew it was going to be a great bridge. The public loved it, too. And Joseph Strauss, with his theatrical style, was ready to give the public what it wanted. 
specially prepared public relations films were distributed to movie houses around the Bay Area to keep interest in the bridge at a fever pitch with the latest news from the worksite. Great Golden Gate Bridge is to span the turbulent mile-wide waters at the entrance to San Francisco Bay. The main span of this bridge is 4,200 feet, which is 700 feet longer than that of the George Washington Bridge over the Hudson River at New York. Just to the rear of old Fort Scott, built 80 years ago with bricks brought around the horn, are the two anchorage blocks, 64,000 tons of steel and concrete, one for each of the two main suspension cables. Running out 1,100 feet into the Golden Gate from the fort is the contractor's working trestle, ending at the South or San Francisco Pier location. The construction of this pier, practically in the open sea, represents one of the most difficult foundation jobs ever attempted. The pier will support one of the two 746-foot steel towers. It was necessary to build the South Tower offshore, but working so far into the open waters of the gate made the trestle a sitting target for disaster. Twice it was sliced in two. Once by a cargo ship lost in heavy fog. Another time by the sheer force of the raging Pacific current, washing two million cubic feet of water past the site every second. The twin disasters cost over 10 months of hard labor to repair. In building this San Francisco pier, it was first necessary to excavate down into the rock to a depth of over 100 feet below the surface of the Golden Gate and over an area of more than an acre. This was done by the pilot bomb method. Small pilot bombs were inserted in the guide tube, carefully located over the spot desired. They were then dropped through this guide tube and fired. Chief Diver Chris Hansen goes down to inspect the bomb location and bring up the firing wires. <laughs> Just said there are lovely mermaids down there, which explains his hurry. When all is clear, the bombs are fired electrically, producing a similar surface effect to that of a depth bomb seeking an enemy submarine. The explosion is the dinner bell for the seagulls, who immediately swarm in to feast on the stunned fish. After a series of these big bombs have been fired, the rock has been loosened sufficiently so the dredger can go to work. From time to time, the management of this theater will present pictures showing the progress being made in building the Golden Gate Bridge. The strenuous hand labor required to build the bridge was far less glamorous than Strauss's PR film suggested. The site was often a deafening cacophony of men and machines. As the elements conspired against the rising of the South Tower, the work on the North Tower proceeded at a record pace. Unlike its waterlocked twin, the North Tower was erected on the solid ground of the Marin County shore. The job demanded split-second timing of material delivery on an unheard-of scale. Mountains of sand, cement, and gravel were floated to the construction site in a non-stop armada of barges, then offloaded into enormous concrete mixing facilities built exclusively for the bridge project. The first challenge was to construct the enormous anchorages to which the bridge's suspension cables would be grounded. Four anchorages, each weighing 240 million pounds, equivalent to 17,000 adult elephants, had to be formed at the site. Mixed concrete was pumped directly to the locations through movable chutes where men could pack and vibrate the thick sludge to remove air pockets in the 12-foot thick blocks laced with steel reinforcing rods. The work was brutal and relentless because once the pouring had begun, work could not stop or the materials would set improperly. Every hour, 120 cubic yards of concrete was pumped into a twisted maze of reinforcing steel. Three shifts every 24 hours under searing sun by day and the crackling glare of floodlights by night. Still, all this work was just preparation for the big job ahead. On the other side of the American continent, the belching infernos of Pennsylvania's steel belt were forging the body of the bridge. It would soon become a framework for the future.
Golden Gate was named by early settlers who understood that the rugged body of water represented a door to the golden opportunities of North America's final frontier. With the Golden Gate Bridge, workers came to collect on the pioneering promise. When construction began in earnest, every man on the job had reached a consensus. The work to be done demanded extraordinary safety considerations, demands which could only be met with the strength of a union. The result was a number of firsts in construction, including the first mandatory use of hard hats and the issuing of safety belts which the men would use to lash themselves to the swaying steel towers. And in contrast to typical job conditions in Depression-era America, the men demanded an end to the shape-up system of hiring in which job bosses would point and pick workers from a pack of hungry men, like choosing so many vegetables from a grocery shelf. At the Golden Gate Bridge, workers were respected for their ability to do the job right. 70,000 tons of steel composed the structure. Huge girders which would support the North Tower were embedded in 98 million pounds of concrete. Massive panels were assembled at the site into 5,000 cells which formed the body of the towers. Then 600,000 rivets on each tower connected the pieces. The process of pounding the white hot rivets was a construction ballet. One mistake could drop molten metal on the heads of men below. Meanwhile, the riveters themselves seemed to contract a strange Golden Gate disease. Dozens of men began losing hair, losing teeth, becoming disoriented and unstable. Chemists soon discovered that when the hot rivets made contact with the primer paint on the steel, Deadly, invisible vapors were inhaled by unsuspecting workers. Respirators quickly became standard equipment. But work moved fast, many times ahead of schedule, thanks to the competitive spirit of the men. You had to be quick and strong and a lot of guts. Climb like a monkey and be as agile as a cat. And be scared of nothing, work hard, Drink like hell, take care of all the women, all the Lucys. <laughs> oh, they loved us. Many women thought the bridge workers were a good catch. After all, these men had jobs and earned up to $11 a day, quite a novelty in 1933. Other men waited in campsites beneath the bridge, waited for bridge workers to lose their nerve or lose their lives creating an opportunity for them to find a job on the project. These were desperate times, and just the scent of opportunity would drive men to desperate measures. Soon, those who envied the bridge workers would not be content to sit and wait any longer. To counteract dizziness, construction medics gave the high steel workers and men with hangovers sauerkraut juice. Golden Gate Bridge will continue in a moment on Modern Marvels. On either side of the Golden Gate, twin towers were reaching staggering heights. Their emerging grandeur was a bitter counterpoint for many men out of work, out of hope. I said there was 100 to 150 men down below the tower <clears throat> waiting for us to fall off or quit so they could get our job. And uh, they stay there uh, until quitting time, then they go. The Depression was taking a serious toll on the morale of the entire country. But in San Francisco, the tensions erupted. 1934, longshoremen went on strike, demanding that they enjoy some of the same working conditions as the men on the Golden Gate Bridge. On the 4th of July, they picketed the docks. The following day, they were the targets of overzealous cops. The 
the battle was rocks against rifles. When the smoke cleared, two workers lay dead in the street. Mayor Rossi decided to take a hard line against the strikers, raising the stakes in an ill-advised move against desperate, hungry men with little to lose. San Francisco has come triumphantly through great disasters, as in the past, we will emerge from the present calamity at no distant date. As to those in this city who willfully seek to prolong strife, either for their own selfish end or for the overthrow of this government and of the government of the United States, all of the forces at my command will be brought to bear to prevent their carrying out uh, their plans. Instead of putting out the fire, he had fanned the flames. The strikers' struggle won emotional support across America. The ship owners are out to smash the powerful West Coast Maritime Union. And we know that if they succeed, they will attempt to smash us next. A defeat for our West Coast brothers is a defeat for all maritime unions. This is our fight and we're out to win. In San Francisco, the public was alarmed by the attack on the dock workers. In an unprecedented show of solidarity, the city went on a general strike. For 10 long, hot days, all work stopped in San Francisco. From elevator operators to restaurant workers to office personnel to the men who were hanging steel on the Golden Gate Bridge. I ordered the National Guard of California to move into San Francisco strike area to safeguard life, to protect state property, and to preserve order. There will be no turning back from the position I have taken in this matter. San Francisco had reached a critical stage. Food was in short supply because drivers refused to enter the city. Heavy weapons were called out and aimed at civilians. Finally, the pressure became too great. Management agreed to union negotiations and the strike ended without further bloodshed. But the defiance exhibited in San Francisco resonated in repression across the United States. The anger which escalated during the strike confrontations was in sharp contrast with the attitude of solidarity on the bridge project. And this contrast seemed to fuel an unresolved class struggle America would endure for decades. Yet from the soaring heights of the Golden Gate Bridge, the wail of the depression was just a whisper on the wind. own account, Al Zampa was one of the toughest SOBs ever to have. Hang steel. He was still in his early twenties when he danced the slick narrow girders of the Golden Gate. I was the youngest and everybody, they, they was amazed that I could do that work. You know, most guys learn, and they, they try it, but they couldn't make it. They got scared. Like all men who work in the skies, Zampa understood that the possibility of sudden death was part of the job. In a single instant, a careless slip could send a man hurtling to his doom slamming his body against the surface of the water below with the impact of 15,000 pounds per square inch, a force equal to a car hitting a brick wall at 80 miles an hour. To 
offer some measure of protection and to boost the confidence of the workers, a trapeze net was suspended 60 feet under construction areas. The first time this safety measure had ever been used on a bridge project. We never had a net before. It's the first time using it. It was just like night and day. I mean, guys would dance around for a If they catch them, they'd fire, you know. We'd jump from one beam to the other. I worked up in the steel and didn't realize many times I wasn't even up there. That's how relaxed I was. The net offered psychological reassurance to most of the men, but Al Zampa fell from an area of the North Tower where the slack fabric was improperly suspended over hard ground. So the protection did not match its promise. We had the net, we didn't have to worry. Oh, and Al, Al hit the net. Well, when I went down, I wasn't scared. I figured the net's going to catch me. You know, where the net was on the ground. And you know, pull it up tight, you know. And I hit the net, I, I flipped three times, you know. And I came down and flat on my back. Cracked four vertebrae, hell, it killed another guy. And never even knocked me out. After 12 weeks frozen in traction, Zampa had to learn to walk again like an infant taking its first tentative steps. But he had earned his admission into a select fraternity. Eight of us already went in the net. And the first two guys got hurt. I, I was the only one that got hurt bad. His miracle survival attracted the attention of the tabloids. They suggested a name for Zampa and his fallen comrades. Well, I'd say halfway to hell, club and back, I said, oh no, halfway to hell. Because, why? You say, well, we're only halfway. We didn't die. We're only halfway. He said, okay. I said, besides, most iron workers go to hell anyway. The guys told me, oh, hell, you lost your nerve. You'll never make it no more. Ah, oh, it's baloney. So when I got out of the hospital, I went out and walked over. That place didn't bother me at all. But I, it had me thinking, oh, I got a little white, a little lightheaded, you know. I know I could do it. I'd done it. Al Zampa's injury was part of the economic equation of the undertaking. When the project began, it was generally accepted that one worker would be killed for every million dollars spent on construction. As Joseph Strauss completed his blueprints for the bridge, he assumed that nearly three dozen men would never see the completed job, that the bridge would become the place where widows and orphans would go to remember the husbands and fathers they loved and lost. As it turned out, safety considerations resulted in a loss of only one-third of the estimated death, primarily due to a single accident on February 17, 1937, when a moving scaffold slipped off the bridge and through the protection net below, effectively lashing ten men to the heavy steel and dragging them to their doom in the icy waters of the gate. I think I'm special. I always thought I was. After I worked on them bridges, I said, I know I'm, I'm, I'm special. A dedicated team of engineers designed the Golden Gate Bridge. Tens of thousands of ordinary people put up their homes to finance the project. But Al Zampa knows who really owns the structure. The men whose blood, sweat, and tears were the glue that bonded those girders together. I got fingerprints all over the steel. That's from hanging on. <laughs> Not one hand for the company and one for you. you use both hands for yourself. <laughs> to support the massive weight of the Golden Gate Bridge, more than 80,000 miles of steel cable would be forged to the width of a pencil. Shipped to the bridge site, these coils were joined into 30-mile lengths with a special cable splice. Screws were first embossed into the wire by hydraulic presses. 
Then a threadless sleeve was slipped over two adjoining ends and molded together under tremendous pressure to fill the grooves and seal the bond. These connections were stronger than the steel wire itself. Bridge wire was specially designed for the Golden Gate Bridge from carbon and alloy steel flat wire, meeting exacting characteristics. Samples from each roll were tested for elongation and strength exceeding 235,000 pounds per square inch. In the end, these flexible wires would be part of three foot thick cables, but it was necessary to weave the cables on site. 746 feet above the water surface in brutal wind conditions which many times exceeded 45 miles an hour. At first shipping lanes were closed so that the first strands could be dragged across the gate by Coast Guard vessels. Movements were choreographed by radio operators who directed pilots through the treacherous waters. Hello Coast Guard Hello, Coast Guard. South Tower talking. Go ahead, Barge. Okay, we're coming across. Cranes lifted the first small strands to the top. Once the first few strands were in place, a mid-span work platform was lowered across the gap. The operation was not a complete success. The platform became stuck on the initial strands. Two bridgemen volunteered to crawl hand over foot across the swaying span to free the platform. In the vernacular of the bridgemen, this is called swimming the cable. Their act of bravery won them a place in the history books. Muggs Anderson and Clyde Hepworth unwittingly became the first men to cross the suspension of the Golden Gate. With these first few thin strands, the mighty cables would be bundled and draped over the steel tower superstructures. On either shore, the wires connected to massive adjusting rods, while 150-ton saddles over the top of the towers cradled the cable in place. A network of spinning wheel carriages transported 27,572 wires across the span, six wires at a time. Individual wires were placed by hand into a geometric pattern, then radio transmissions instructed the opposing bases to tighten the stretch. Enormous reels of fresh wire were woven into the bridge with alarming speed. During one record-breaking eight-hour shift, a thousand miles of wire were spun over the gate. This spirit of accomplishment allowed the suspension of the cables to be completed in only 191 days. But as the men cheered the arrival of the last strand on May 20th, 1936, they knew the job was far from over. Even before the cables were complete, 3,000 wooden pallets were attached, creating a swaying catwalk over the bay. From here, workers could supervise the last stage of the weaving, the compacting of the wire bundles. First by hand, then with the help of hydraulic machinery, the thousands of wires were bonded together, then wrapped in a tight cocoon of steel thread. Every millimeter of the final cable was manicured by powerful metal fingers, then painted to assure a watertight seal. The result was twin cables exactly three feet in diameter. From these, the roadway would be suspended from vertical cables, then being manufactured nearly 3,000 miles to the east. Yet at this incomplete stage, the concept of how a suspension bridge performs its task becomes most evident. From the delicate arch of steel would drop the suspension cables, each created to precise specifications for its placement. The suspenders drop to attach a level stretch of steel presses and roadway panels along horizontal beams, 25 feet apart, 90 feet long, 8.5 feet deep. 
Bridgeman rode the enormous steel supports into position as the one and a half mile track blossomed over the bay. Twisted webs of steel rods were laid across the width of the bridge, welded together, bathed in tons of concrete delivered by narrow gauge locomotives. Giant leveling machines ground the surface to a seamless ribbon of roadway while painters marked the lanes where traffic would soon flow. As a last touch of cosmetic waterproofing, painters covered the cables with international orange, the official color of the bridge as dictated by Joseph Strauss himself. Many of the men who worked their way down the length of the cables brought along their lunch for one last leisurely meal atop the bridge. From their perspective over the bay, they could see more than the Golden Gate's gleaming towers of progress or the city of San Francisco glimmering in the distance. From here, they could see a piece of the future. From here, it was the promise of prosperity. From this height, the problems and passions of the world seem part of one grand, glorious design. And they were the master builders. Nobody knows the name of the first pedestrian to walk the length of the Golden Gate Bridge. A blind woman and her guide dog were given that privilege the day before the structure opened to the public. It was the last private moment the bridge would ever have. The following day, May 27, 1937, just over four years since the beginning of construction, the span was overrun by hundreds of thousands of enthusiastic citizens anxious for a first look at their big investment. Festivities began with the driving of a ceremonial golden rivet at mid-span, hammered into place by Edwin Ironhorse Stanley, the same man who drove the very first rivet on the bridge four years earlier. Then the multitudes clamored to make themselves part of history. One man crossed the span on stilts. One woman walked the entire distance sticking out her tongue. This person was determined to wear the first wooden hat to traverse the bridge. On the second day of the celebration, Joseph Strauss supervised the cutting of a symbolic steel chain, and cars were allowed to cross for the first time. It was clear that a new era was dawning, that the territory being bridged represented more than a finger of sea between two rocky shores. It was a triumphant demonstration of people's will, redefining the world, molding a defiant nature to serve people's dreams. The joy was infectious. The celebration lasted a full seven days and nights as marching bands and parade floats trumpeted a vigorous community, lifting itself from the shackles of the Depression. Over one and a quarter billion cars have crossed the span since its opening in 1937, paying nearly $75,000 each day in tolls. On July 1st, 1971, the entire cost of the bridge had been repaid through toll collection with interest. That figure was $150 million. Great projects often owe themselves to people whose vision exceeds rational expectations. In San Francisco, there stands a permanent reminder of one exceptional moment when dreams and determination fell into alignment. A moment that is celebrated with each passing car. A crew of 38 painters continually touches up the bridge with orange vermilion paint. Modern marvels will return in a moment.
San Francisco is a chemistry of color and climate, a sparkling mirage of white and blue and gold kissed by the crisp breath of the Pacific. Magical spirits hover in the wind over these waters, yet for the men who maintain the Golden Gate Bridge, the beauty of the bay is tempered by harsh elements that continually punish the lofty steel towers. At this dizzying height, the lives of the people depend on a steady hand and a calm demeanor. Although there was an elevator for workers inside the towers, it is only the size of a phone booth, and they still have to climb the cables in the brisk Pacific gales. All the workers, even the iron workers or anybody good, you have to, for safety reasons, you can't go out with a chip on your shoulder and you have to be very careful at all times. It only takes one slip and you're in the water. You know, you look down there and you say, I'd hate to hit it. Tragically, the lure of leaping has proven irresistible for more than 800 people. The first uh, person I ever saw jumping was a lady, and I didn't know, and I said, there, you can't do that. She went over the side and jumped. They were all laughing at me at what I had said there, but she just... The way it is that the one that will jump will jump and the one that's going to be saved will be saved. Today, the bridge is a cherished member of the community and the half-century celebration of its opening mirrored the same enthusiasm seen when it first opened to the public. The uh, 50th anniversary was a wonderful experience. The weather was fine. Uh, although we had planned for 40 to 50,000 people, it was closer to 250 to 275,000 people at any one time out there on the bridge. We closed the bridge and uh, we started out and we had a celebration that was probably one of the most magnificent ever held here in the Bay Area, but we had well over 300,000 people on the structure. And uh, we had to stop transit at uh, 5.15 in the morning because we couldn't accommodate any more people. We had both the south and north approaches jammed wall to wall with people. The bridge did flatten out a little. At a total weight of nearly one million tons, the bridge stood firm under the pressure of pedestrians. And experts agree it's likely to stand firm through most any natural or unnatural calamity. ever match the yawning expanse of the Golden Gate. Certainly no other structure matches the simple, elegant design of the spectacular suspension. Today it's difficult to imagine this turbulent stretch of sea without the Golden Gate Bridge linking the rocky shorelines. The towering deco facades announce the technical triumph of people but the significance of the bridge transcends the cost of materials, the challenge of the elements, even the half century of service managing traffic in the Bay Area. The Golden Gate Bridge, more than anything else, is a tribute to the concept of community. The willingness of people to make sacrifices for each other, to build links between people, to promote partnership as a lofty path to brave new worlds. In the end, the Golden Gate Bridge offers an emotional resonance. It reminds us that common values articulated in uncommon effort allow the work of people to almost rival the exaltation of angels. Tonight on the History Channel, when it comes to bridges, dams, blimps, cars, planes, and rockets, what could possibly go wrong? Learn the grim truth about the technological era on engineering disasters tonight at 8 on the History Channel. It was done by the pilot bomb method. 
Small pilot bombs were inserted in the guide tube, carefully located over the spot desired. They were then dropped through this guide tube and fired. Chief Diver Chris Hansen goes down to inspect the bomb location and bring up the firing wires. <laughs> Just said there are lovely mermaids down there, which explains this hurry. When all is clear, the bombs are fired electrically, producing a similar surface effect to that of a depth bomb seeking an enemy submarine. The explosion is the dinner bell for the seagulls, who immediately swarm in to feast on the stunned fish. After a series of these big bombs have been fired, the rock has been loosened sufficiently so the dredger can go to work. From time to time, the management of this theater will present pictures showing the progress being made in building the Golden Gate Bridge. The strenuous hand labor required to build the bridge was far less glamorous than Strauss's PR film suggested. The site was often a deafening cacophony of men and machines. As the elements conspired against the rising of the South Tower, the work on the North Tower proceeded at a record pace. Unlike its waterlocked twin, the North Tower was erected on the solid ground of the Marin County shore. The job demanded split-second timing of material delivery on an unheard-of scale. Mountains of sand, cement, and gravel were found, and a calm demeanor. Although there was an elevator for workers inside the towers, it is only the size of a phone booth, and they still have to climb the cables in the brisk Pacific gales. All the workers, even the iron workers or anybody good, you have to, for safety reasons, you can't go out with a chip on your shoulder and you have to be very careful at all times. It only takes one slip and you're in the water. You know, you look down there and you say, I'd hate to hit it. Tragically, the lure of leaping has proven irresistible for more than 800 people. The first uh, person I ever saw jumping was a lady, and I didn't know, and I said, there, you can't do that. She went over the side and jumped. They were all laughing at me at what I had said there, but she just, the way it is, that the one that will jump will jump, and the one that's going to be saved will be saved. Today, the bridge is a cherished member of the community, and the half-century celebration of its opening mirrored the same enthusiasm seen when it first opened to the public. The uh, 50th anniversary was a wonderful experience. The weather was fine. Uh, although we had planned for 40 to 50,000 people, it was closer to 250 to 275,000 people at any one time out there. Reveled in the lascivious lifestyle of the city by the bay. Eventually, the boom went bust, but San Francisco had already been branded a modern city of Sodom by the rest of a puritanical America. There even seemed to be a suggestion of divine retribution when the earthquake in 1906 caused destruction of biblical proportions. Yet San Francisco and its body spirit stood firm. Out of the ashes arose a people even more determined to revel in the zeal of independence. They were the vanguard of a bold 20th century America. In an ironic twist, mass production in the early 1900s made independence accessible for millions. Inexpensive automobiles allowed the common man the means to chart his own course. The concept was all-American, and the rebellious social pioneers of San Francisco were quick to embrace the freedom of mobility. They were particularly fond of weekend jaunts out of the city. We had a celebration that was probably one of the most magnificent ever held here in the Bay Area, but we had well over 300,000 people on the structure, and uh, we had to stop transit at uh, 5.15 in the morning because we couldn't accommodate any more people. We had both the south and north approaches jammed wall to wall with people. The bridge did flatten out a little. At a total weight of nearly one million tons, the bridge stood firm under the pressure of pedestrians. 
and experts agree it's likely to stand firm through most any natural or unnatural calamity. bridges ever match the yawning expanse of the Golden Gate. Certainly no other structure matches the simple, elegant design of the spectacular suspension. Today it's difficult to imagine this turbulent stretch of sea without the Golden Gate Bridge linking the rocky shorelines. The towering deco facades announce the technical triumph of people. But the significance of the bridge transcends the cost of materials. The groundbreaking ceremonies by turning the first shovel full of earth. He then delivers the golden spade to President William P. Filmer, who instructs Chief Engineer Joseph B. Strauss to start actual construction work on the bridge. And so the maximum accomplishment of engineering science of the 20th century is officially launched. At last, a glimmer of hope that seemed so distant was turning into physical reality where there was once only the gloom of depression was the roar of industry. A city on the edge of America was fighting for its future with a giant-sized dream. It attracted a nation of men hungry for work. Well, I loved that golden day so bad that, man, I would have worked there for nothing if I could get by without, without any money. <laughs> I loved it. I knew it was going to be a great bridge. The public loved it too, and Joseph Strauss, with his theatrical style, was ready to give the public what it wanted. Specially prepared public relations films were distributed to movie houses around the Bay Area to keep interest in the bridge at a fever pitch with the latest news from the work site. The great Golden Gate Bridge is to span the turbulent mile-wide waters at the entrance to San Francisco Bay. The main span of this bridge is 4,200 feet, which is 700 feet longer than that of the George Washington Bridge over... ...lemma of Bay Area traffic congestion on the ferry system. Unfortunately, that ferry concession was big business for its owner, the Southern Pacific Railroad Company. It held a monopoly on the franchise worth tens of millions of dollars, which it would lose if a bridge were to be built. To stop the project, Southern Pacific mounted over 2,300 legal disputes. It took an area-wide boycott of the ferry system to force Southern Pacific to drop its nuisance lawsuits. But the people of the Bay Area would be asked to do much more to make the bridge dream come true. Nine years after the bridge was first proposed, the Depression was threatening to tear apart the social fabric of America. There was barely enough money for food. Certainly insufficient funds for government to finance the largest bridge project in human history at a proposed cost of $35 million. Still, men needed work, and San Francisco needed a bridge. Then what happened is something that I submit very, very few people in today's world would ever consider doing, but they held an election in which the people of the six counties went to the polls and they put up their property, that is their homes, their farms, their vineyards, their commercial buildings, as a collateral to guarantee a $35 million bond issue to height. The lives of the people depend on a steady hand and a calm demeanor. Although there was an elevator for workers inside the towers, it is only the size of a phone booth, and they still have to climb the cables in the brisk Pacific gales. All the workers, even the iron workers or anybody good, you have to, for safety reasons, you can't go out with a chip on your shoulder, and you have to be very careful at all times. It only takes one slip and you're in the water. You know, you look down there and you say, I'd hate to hit it. Tragically, the lure of leaping has proven irresistible for more than 800 people. The first uh, person I ever saw jumping was a lady, and I didn't know, and I said, there, you can't do that. She went over the side and jumped. They were all laughing at me at what I had said there, but 
she just the way it is that the one that will jump will jump and the one that's going to be saved will be saved Today, the bridge is a cherished member of the community, and the half-century celebration of its opening mirrored the same enthusiasm seen when it first opened to the public. The uh, 50th anniversary was a wonderful experience. The weather was fine. Uh, although we had planned for 40 to 50,000 people, it was closer to... Guard! Hello, Coast Guard! South Tower talking! Go ahead, Barge. Okay, we're coming across. Cranes lifted the first small strands to the top. Once the first few strands were in place, a mid-span work platform was lowered across the gap. The operation was not a complete success. The platform became stuck on the initial strands. Two bridgemen volunteered to crawl hand over foot across the swaying span to free the platform. In the vernacular of the bridgemen, this is called swimming the cable. Their act of bravery won them a place in the history books. Muggs Anderson and Clyde Hepworth unwittingly became the first men to cross the suspension of the Golden Gate. With these first few thin strands, the mighty cables would be bundled and draped over the steel tower superstructures. On either shore, the wires connected to massive adjusting rods, while 150-ton saddles over the top of the towers cradled the cable in place. A network of spinning wheel carriages transported 27,572 wires across the span. Six wires at a time. Ending at the South or San Francisco Pier location. The construction of this pier, practically in the open sea, represents one of the most difficult foundation jobs ever attempted. The pier will support one of the two 746-foot steel towers. It was necessary to build the South Tower offshore. But working so far into the open waters of the gate made the trestle a sitting target for disaster. Twice it was sliced in two. Once by a cargo ship lost in heavy fog. Another time by the sheer force of the raging Pacific current, washing two million cubic feet of water past the site every second. The twin disasters cost over 10 months of hard labor to repair. In building this San Francisco pier, it was first necessary to excavate down into the rock to a depth of over 100 feet below the surface of the Golden Gate and over an area of more than an acre. This was done by the pilot bomb method. Small pilot bombs were inserted in the guide tube, carefully located over the spot desired. They were then dropped through this guide tube and fired. Chief Diver Chris Hansen goes down to inspect the bomb location and bring up the firing wires. <laughs> Just said there are lovely mermaids down there, which explains his hurry. When all is clear, the bombs are fired electrically, producing a similar surface effect to that of a depth bomb seeking an enemy submarine. The outpost in the hills northeast of San Francisco. Here was the long-sought American dream, a boisterous blend of good luck, hard work, and eccentric charm. Within two years, San Francisco's population soared over 7,000 percent as gold fever attracted legions of fortune hunters with nothing to lose. With unrestricted wealth came all the pleasures of the flesh. Drinking, gambling, opium and prostitution helped give San Francisco's waterfront the Barbary Coast a reputation for hedonistic abandon. Early motion pictures reveled in the lascivious lifestyle of the city by the bay. Eventually, the boom went bust, but San Francisco had already been branded a modern city of Sodom by the rest of a puritanical America. There even seemed to be a suggestion of divine retribution when the earthquake in 1906 caused destruction of biblical proportions. Yet San Francisco and its body spirit stood firm. 
Out of the ashes arose a people even more determined to revel in the bridge wire was specially designed for the Golden Gate Bridge from carbon and alloy steel flat wire, meeting exacting characteristics. Samples from each roll were tested for elongation and strength exceeding 235,000 pounds per square inch. In the end, these flexible wires would be part of three foot thick cables but it was necessary to weave the cables on site, 746 feet above the water surface in brutal wind conditions, which many times exceeded 45 miles an hour. At first, shipping lanes were closed so that the first strands could be dragged across the gate by Coast Guard vessels. Movements were choreographed by radio operators who directed pilots through the treacherous waters. Hello, Coast Guard. Hello, Coast Guard. South Tower talking. Go ahead, Barge. Okay, we're coming across. Cranes lifted the first small strands to the top. Once the first few strands were in place, a mid-span work platform was lowered across the gap. The operation was not a complete success. The platform became stuck on the initial strands. Two bridgemen volunteered to crawl, hand over every hour 120 cubic yards of concrete was pumped into a twisted maze of reinforcing steel. Three shifts every 24 hours under searing sun by day and the crackling glare of floodlights by night. Still, all this work was just preparation for the big job ahead. On the other side of the American continent, the belching infernos of Pennsylvania's steel belt were forging the body of the bridge. It would soon become a framework for the future. The Golden Gate was named by early settlers who understood that the rugged body of water represented a door to the golden opportunities of North America's final frontier. With the Golden Gate Bridge, workers came to collect on the pioneering promise. When construction began in earnest, every man on the job had reached a consensus. The work to be done demanded extraordinary safety considerations, demands which could only be met with the strength of a union. The result was a number of firsts in construction, including the first mandatory use of hard hats and the issuing of safety belts which the men would use to lash themselves to the swaying strike ended without further bloodshed. But the defiance exhibited in San Francisco resonated in repression across the United States. The anger which escalated during the strike confrontations was in sharp contrast with the attitude of solidarity on the bridge project. And this contrast seemed to fuel an unresolved class struggle America would endure for decades. Yet from the soaring heights of the Golden Gate Bridge, the wail of the depression was just a whisper on the wind. own account, Al Zampa was one of the toughest SOBs ever to have. Hang steel. He was still in his early twenties when he